Today on the program, what would you do if your child were violent, aggressive, had no empathy, and had hurt you, your other children, or your family pets? Our guests today say they are desperate for help and are here with chilling stories. Back in February, we first brought you the story of Dawn Davies. She wrote a book called Mothers of Sparta, a memoir in pieces, which is a collection of essays about her life and the ups and downs of parenthood. At the end of the book, Dawn discloses that she has a son who has been diagnosed with various brain disorders, a boy who lacks empathy, and who she fears might one day harm himself or someone else. Her segment resonated deeply with some of our viewers. Take a look. We went through a number of schools and he started getting picked on there terribly badly. They knocked him down, they threw spitballs on his hair, they called him names, uh, which I won't repeat. And then one night he was going to sleep and he said, mommy, I just wanna die. Puberty started happening. Uh, I think something happens with um, when hormones start going through the body, um, it changes brain chemistry. He'd go to a friend's house and the friend's sister had a ham hamster and he killed it. Um, he confessed to a number of animals and he had no idea. I don't know if my son knows right from wrong, but my biggest fear is that he's going to do something that gets him arrested. She's trying to say, I, I perceive a danger here with my own son, which is not easy. We should say Dawn's son gave her permission to be here today uh, and to tell the story and to tell the story in the book. And no one will help. There isn't a group home. There's, I mean, is it basically jail or nothing? Yeah, it is, and, and we've been told that. So um, the options so far before he was 18 is line of sight contact at all times. Which so you're expected that, to watch him at all, all day, 24-7. Yeah, 24-7. We ended up homeschooling um, last year because that's how we handled it, um, his last year of high school, um, and, or wait till he offends. But you can't, you can't do that for a child with a brain disorder. I watched the segment this morning with Megan Kelly about Don Davies and her personal struggle with her son with tears streaming down my face. I too have been struggling to find help for our son who has been diagnosed with a regulatory brain disorder. Don Davies is back with us now with an update on her son whose identity she has chosen to keep private. She is joined by Amy Cluley, whose five-year-old son Evan has been diagnosed with regulatory brain disorder. Good morning to you both. Hi. You okay? I know it's scary to, to be here. And Don, you were so courageous to come on and share that story and to write the book. Can I first ask you, how, how is your son doing now? So an update since I saw you last, um, we were denied housing for residential care and I made a formal appeal to the board and we're waiting to hear on that. Um, I've since found, so one of the things that I do is I, I, I interview doctors to see if they can handle it. So I'll disclose, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this. Um, can you handle that? And some of them will go, ooh, that's not my thing. Maybe I'll give you a colleague. The colleague usually doesn't work out. So I think one year I went through 33 doctors on our insurance plan. Um, and now I'm just going off insurance. And I found a guy who um, is willing to maybe consider we have an OCD, obsessive compulsive component to this, and who might be willing to see if cognitive behavioral therapy will work. I don't know if it will, but as a, I feel like I'm managing his medical care. I'm managing his care because um, diagnosis is hard. I'm not even sure we have a, a, a correct one, um, but we do have an appointment with somebody. So he is living on his own um, in an apartment. He can't get work. He got fired from a job um, because he has frontal lobe problems and cannot control his impulses. So work is hard. We were denied by vocational rehab. Um, services. They said he needed mental health services before we got voc rehab. So we can't get the mental health services because the appointments are every, we can get one appointment every three months through that agency that works with voc rehab. So we can get four appointments a year and then that's not enough for voc rehab to give him help. So we have no job. Um, we're about to be evicted from an apartment. He is, his own apartment. And um, he needs residential help and we were denied. So that's where we're at right now. Mm. He can't live with you. You disclosed the last Correct. time that he, he has an OCD issue with, with child pornography. Yep. 
and if that can't be on your computers, that, that you could be in trouble with that. It can't be on my computer. So you have to draw a line as a parent, and it's it's very, very difficult to draw that line because he's my baby, and he sounds like we're, we're, we're painting him like a monster. He's not. He's a nice guy. He's a good person. He can't stop. He tells me, I can't stop. I, I don't know how to stop, and no one can help me stop. The other day we were out, and, um, and I had a headache or something, and I said, oh, gosh, my head really hurts. And he said, I'm really sorry. I said, well, thanks. And he says, I know I really don't care. Like, I can't feel that I'm very sorry, but I know that I, th I think I need to say that I'm sorry because that will help you. Mm -hmm. And so he's, and we talked about him not feeling the empathy, and he says he wishes he could do it, but he can't feel it. Um, um, but he's aware of that, which he's, is somewhat, well, we talk about some it. progress. Yeah, I talk about everything with him. Amy, can, can you just describe your feeling when you saw Dawn come out with this story? I, just, I was amazed that she had the guts to do it, really. Um, her analogy of being a mother of Sparta, the constant waiting for battle or in battle, is something that I experience on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Constant, I have to constantly watch where he is, what he's doing. And she just, a lot of the things that she said made sense, and lack of care is a huge issue. Right. You can't get anybody to help you. You have a 14-year-old daughter, yes. and then there's Evan, who's five. Yes. And I know you say your daughter was so excited to have a sibling. Yes. She didn't want to be a lonely child anymore. And she wanted to not lonely instead of only. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we thought, yes, let's do this for her. Let's give her another part of our life and not expecting what would be before us. But part of what happens when you have a child with a brain disorder is that child can blow up not only your life, but the life of your entire family. Exactly. And so your daughter's life has changed how? Your older child? We, we do things separately. Um, we tag team. I go with her or dad goes with her to her functions. Um, and the other one stays home with Evan. Evan rarely goes out, um, which is sad because you want them to have a life, go to the zoo, do the things that normal people do, if you want to call it normal. What, what is a typical day in the life like with him? Um, we, I have to like sleep with the one I open because he can just get up now and go about the house and wake up sister and wake up dad. And so I try to grab him first and then we go downstairs and there's a demand for breakfast that he might eat, might not. Just depends on what it's gonna get accomplished between the time of getting up and going to school. So he's going from room to room to room. Please put your clothes on, please put your shoes on, please try and do these things. And he gets angry that he has to put his shirt on. Constant prompting, constant. Constant, and he doesn't have that part of the brain that works that says, if I have to go outside and there's snow on the ground, I must put shoes on. He would just rather not put the shoes on, period. And then there are, there are fits of rage. Oh yeah, he's very angry that you're asking him to put the shoes on, because in his mind, he doesn't need the shoes. It's not cold outside. I know you've said you two cannot get help. I cannot. This is, this is what you, you, you said to us. How do you deny help? How do you deny help to someone who gets so angry that he rips his mother's sleeve off of her sweater in a fit of rage? How do you deny someone who has videotape footage and notes upon notes of the person's total disconnect and what appears to be insanity? How do you deny a house filled with others who are unable to manage the person who needs help and who is constantly living in turmoil? Mm -hmm. That's our house. Why can't you get help? What, what well, did the doctor say? I was telling Don earlier <clears throat> my husband is a stage four colon cancer survivor year out. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so we beat that. And I remember sitting in the doctor's office and the doctor saying, you have cancer. Here's where you go. This is the doctor you'll see. This is the treatment. This is the follow-up. Here's some respite care. All these amazing things. And his colon needed intervention. It needed attention. It had to be treated and fixed. Evan has a brain that's not functioning properly. It's an organ no different than the colon within the human body, and I can't get help for him because insurance won't cover the treatment that we think would be best or beneficial for him, and the cost is so exorbitant. It's like $39,000 a year just for therapy to come into my home and teach him that you need to put your shoes on and teach us how to get his brain to wake up and understand what he's doing. So intervention isn't being happening with him and his brain, we don't have a treatment plan in place. And it's like, I had hope with cancer, like there was a hope at the end, like, oh, we're gonna fix this. And with this, 
there's no hope because doors are shut from insurance standpoint. I can't get Medicaid because they would rather I divorce my husband, give my child up to the state. Um, and that's just not going to happen. I have a strong marriage. I have a family unit. You shouldn't be forced to make these choices. There, there's another mom. Um, she was profiled in The Atlantic who put it this way. She said, getting, getting this kind of diagnosis for your child, it's a terminal diagnosis, except your child's not going to die. It's just that there's no help. Exactly. There's no help. Hello today, fans. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking that button down there and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives.